Um, the Llama Lounge to me was the best event I've, I've ever been to on the local scene. Uh, I keep going to events hoping to recapture the magic of the Llama Lounge. Don't know what it was. It, I don't know whether it was on the cheap or whether it was expensive or the people that were going there, but there was something very, very special happening for a while. So what brought the Llama Lounge into being? Whose idea was it? Was there any master plan for it? Or was it just, let's just do something? It, it actually came out of an argument <laughs> between um, Holly and I, Holly Jeffrey and I, um, where we were making sushi. And we had a little argument about people procrastinating. And we just thought, let's do something that involves the filmmakers we know, uh, the photographers. Like, let's put a gig on, let's get the narcolepsy penguin down to do something. Um, and uh, we could get that Emily Half to come along and show her film and do some photography. And uh, basically, we were like, wow, you know, this. Ooh, it's a pretty good idea, like, we've had this argument and <laughs> we've resolved it by going, well, how can we make things, you know, how can we be the change we want to see? So we wanted something community-focused that people, as a community, put their effort into, and that's what it always was, you know. It's what it always turned into. It was lots of people getting together, even Paige as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The man behind the camera. <laughs> uh, getting together and putting on this event but essentially, it only ever really happened because the next morning after we had this conversation, we wrote a brainstorming session. Because we were going out of the time, we were like, wrote this massive brainstorming session. And it's kind of the way we, it was like catharsis from like having the argument. It's just like, yes, let's do this really crazy idea and get everybody involved in it. And we're like, well, we could do it at like a friend's meeting house. You know, that's kind of an idea. Uh, but why would we need to do it? And then in the morning it's just like, wow, it could have just fizzled out. But we got an email off um, PG's friend and Holly's friend, Kath. Um, she was doing the Otisha project, um, which was uh, like a, a kind of moving around play with a, a portable generator uh, showing about energy efficiency and uh, what the importance of riding a bike instead of having a car, you know. And what you could achieve through minimal uh, environmental impact, I suppose. And she said, do you want to do a fundraiser for us? So we're like, yeah, okay, we'll do it. And uh, what should we call it? And previously, Holly had been through a box of her brother's possessions. It's quite a sensitive subject. Don't really want to go into it. But her brother's not with us anymore. And he was just a wonderful guy. And he did community-based things as well, and uh, charity-based things. Not usually at the same time, but he's a very creative individual. He's a real enigma. Um, he massively influenced Ed into doing community-focused things, and you can see part of Ed in from from Joe. Like you can see part of Ed in him, you know, and vice versa. They were best friends, um, and. Uh, that kind of zenness. Uh, he he had a night called Llama Lounge, and I just said that just make an incredible name. Like we could, we could come up with names forever for what we're about to do, but Llama Lounge just seems like the right name, and it's in his memory, and it embodies everything he thought of with community spirit and selflessness, and everybody coming together for the greater good. I suppose <laughs> it sounds like we're into like a superhero force or something, but you know. No, it's, it was a genuine interest in trying to do something further that would include, be completely inclusive. And you know, early attempts of it like, were quite empty, and then somewhere it just became, it clicked with people and became a bit cool, I suppose. Like, you know, <laughs> I'd say like it was kind of like ripples of talk of talk, and I flyered it a lot. Holly did her work for it. We, we eventually did it at the Angel Centre. Um, which was just the perfect venue for it. Well, in some cases not, but just you know the size of it <laughs> uh, for the drama of it, I suppose, and what we actually wanted to do when it actually came together as what it was supposed to be, it, it worked. Lama <laughs> Lounge is clearly closer to something that you would have at the arts workshop, like Cafe Subterranea. But even the blueprint for those nights, Cafe Subterranea, like arguably. It was Joe, 
you know, but then it's it's a story of two Joes because I was reading a book called uh, White Bicycles and uh, by Joe Boyd mm -hmm. that we mentioned earlier. Well, you mentioned it earlier. Yeah. <laughs> but seriously, yeah. it's, it's a great book, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. And uh, yeah, it talks about the freakouts, the UFO clubs. And I just thought, I want something like this. And when we got to the Dalai Lama, uh, which is that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we got to that, it, it did feel like it had became or even surpassed what it was supposed to be. And it felt like a freak out. And that's exactly what it was supposed to be, I suppose. Uh, just an inclusive freak out. <laughs> well, for saying the Lama Lounge did achieve the kind of magic that it, that it did, it's, it sounds like uh, one of the key things, if you're going to try and recapture that, is to do something that isn't about the ego, that it's about something bigger. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. community spirit, put, put the us, yeah. honouring people, the sort of helping people, having an outcome where it always raised some money for some somebody or something as well. Um, that is different to most gigs that, that I go to. Yeah, arguably MapFest. Uh, you know, they raised £2,036 mm. in three days. Right. For generous donations mm. in the Malvern area. And for an event, you know, was largely not covered in the local press. That was beautiful. Mm -hmm. I only caught the last day of it, and I kind of felt bad. But just go, just being there, you met the right kind of people, and you thought, "Wow, this this kind of thing still exists." Mm -hmm. You know, what, what were the sort of gig highlights of the Lama Lounge where you sort of go, "That was special." What what sort of <laughs> if, if you sort of like to just pick out a couple of times where you're just going, "That was just different." That that was just <laughs> great. Not even weird, but, but just where you've got a sense of that's moving you. <laughs> this is definitely on the record. Um, okay, the first Llama Lounge, Lewis Spellback was played, um, and he went upstairs, and maybe I shouldn't have mentioned this, I don't know if get anybody in trouble, but there was reenactment dresses upstairs, and Ed Steele Fox and him put them on and had a little dance. And that was incredible. <laughs> it was just like, at first they were just waving the dresses around, and then they put the dresses on and danced around. And it was great. It was just like, wow, they ran up to the balcony, grabbed these reenactment dresses, put them on, had a dance, Lewis's loop going, you know. Uh, and it, it was special. I've still got a little video of it off a phone, but it's really, really bad because Peach didn't film the first one. <laughs> it's just kind of a mis our, our mistake. Mm. We didn't really ask him. <laughs> and, I mean, a couple of th to me, I, I thought the Bolly Lama was pretty special. The Indian Puppet Show. Whose idea was that? That was fantastic. That was all the NM um, decided they wanted to do something a bit different. So I think between them they came up with the puppet theatre idea. Um, all he made the actual puppet theatre, and M made the uh, the little <laughs> the little cutout bits, and um, then Joe Taylor. <laughs> but the, from an audience perspective, I was going to a gig. And then the lights went down, and it was such a beautiful atmosphere. And it almost felt like being a kid again. And I felt like I was a kid again, watching it. And it, the way that it just captured everybody in that little moment was, was really touching, actually. It was, I, you don't get that at gigs. I agree. I agree. But it's just setting the mood, isn't it? Mm. If you throw something out there that sets the mood instantaneously, like with um, like the film Nama. You know, Norma, well, yeah. how do you pronounce it? <laughs> Phil Norma? <laughs> Phil Norma? Yeah. yeah. You know, how do you pronounce that? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, we never really figured it out. Maybe I just can't pronounce it. But uh, I dreamt it. It's like I dreamt the idea that we were going to the Angel Centre, that everybody was dressed up as mods and gangsters. Maybe I exaggerated my dream and I described it in the conservatory when I was slightly uh, battered. Mm. But <laughs> described it to M and uh, Rich Clark, and they were just like, there, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> you know, that sounds like a great idea. Why don't you do it? You know, and I just got up and we'd, we'd having the smoke, and I'd, I just told them about this dream, and then it was just like, yeah, let's do it. And then Holly's just like, yeah, okay, we'll do that. And I went outside when we actually had the film armor, 
Um, I came back in, everybody was dressed up as gangsters, some people had replica guns. <laughs> <laughs> it was just really, really silly. And there was projections on the wall, and there was like gramophone music playing, <laughs> and bubbles flying around, and it was just like, this is my dream. <laughs> yeah, this is literally my dream. <laughs> and the other beauty of it as well was, it cost nothing to get in, and even 16 year old kids were coming in because it was free to get in, there was no licensing thing going on, so there was no under 18s and things. And Yeah, there was no real dodginess going on no. at all. You would expect that not to be the case in Angel Place. So it's kind of the offshoot of it, was mm. well, the, the, uh, the negative of the La Lounge being in Angel Place was that you leave the Angel Centre where everything's kind of like this hippie crazy vibe of avant garde. But mixed with contemporary and I don't know, whatever it was. <laughs> and you know, you have this crazy theme. People dressed up in costumes walk out into Angel Place and you've got loads of drunk people coming out of tramps trying to start fights on them or whatever, <laughs> I don't know. I, I never actually <laughs> saw any trouble like, even leaving God. though, I don't think. I think it, it all kind of mixed pretty well, didn't it? But I think mean, it was tolerated. Yeah. <laughs> so when did it was was it a sudden change or a subtle a subtle change where it it seemed to suddenly lose that magic again? What happened then? It became less of a community focus right. through I think me and Holly having disagreements. I didn't really make things easy sometimes, and vice versa. It just happens, you know. Um, through various disagreements and conflicting personalities. Uh, it came to a natural end, as far as I was concerned. We got kicked out of the Angel Centre and we got moved to the Arts Workshop and any event moving, it finds it very hard to get that spirit again, I suppose. It's a different building. You know. spiritual, spiritual home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was just everything that made it what it was just took its course and people went off to do different things. You know, you have to understand that there was a thriving scene to begin with. But people just became quite insular. Lama Lounge opened it up again. And then people became insular again, I suppose.